to start recording. <clears throat> okay. Oh, and Savon's here. And we're recording. Okay, great. So um, thank you all for uh, making the time today. Um, this is just for the record, James Pepper, chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, today is November 19th, 2021, and this is our um, meeting of the full Cannabis Advisory Panel. Um, and today, um, what we're going to do is review the rules um, that we've, uh, that Bryn and David have drafted, and, the, and they're largely a reflection of all of the incredible work that um, this advisory panel um, did over there since since uh, September, which by our count is over 70 meetings, um, that's seven zero meetings of the advisory committee and the subcommittees. So really just, you all went above and beyond which, you know, I think you all signed up for, um, but we have a path forward now. Um, uh, I think it, Nelly has sent around the minutes um, and, uh, and if we could, um, maybe uh, someone from the advisory committee, uh, if you've had a chance to review them, um, give us a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve the minutes. <clears throat> so Chris, Chris uh, Walsh second. and Jim seconded. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right, well then, um, I'm gonna turn things over to Bryn and David. Um, in addition to um, kind of reviewing uh, some of our rules, they also are going to give you kind of what the next phase of the cannabis work uh, is going to look like. Okay, so hello everyone. For the record, Bryn Hare from the Cannabis Control Board, Executive Director. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, this is the purpose of this meeting today is really to do a high level um, review of the rules. So I just wanted to start out by thanking the advisory committee for um, the incredible work that you've done in supporting the board's work and uh, just reiterate how appreciative the board is of all of the time you've committed to this project. Um, so as I mentioned, we are going to do a high level review of the rules today. Um, as everyone's aware, the board has had to work really quickly to achieve the deadlines that have been set out in statute. So to that end, um, we've developed two of what will be probably five rules. Um, and the purpose today is to uh, preview those drafts with you, um, but not to take any formal action on the rules. Um, they're still in draft format, and um, as I'm sure you'll hear emphasized over and over today, they are subject to change um, before we pre-file them. So to start out, uh, David's going to uh, give the advisory committee kind of an update on where the board is in the process um, of rulemaking. So this is a little overview of the next steps uh, and where we've been. I know that uh, this was this was designed for general public consumption. So some of this stuff I know that folks uh, on this advisory committee are quite familiar with. So I'll run through it quickly. Um, but the, uh, as you know, a couple of different statutory laws gave the board the obligation to write administrative rules. And a lot of the work that the, the remarkable work you've all been doing over the last few months has really been uh, geared towards allowing us and allowing the board to make those decisions and making those rules. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the terminology, administrative rules are similar to laws the legislature passes. Anybody who engages in activities that are regulated by a state agency have to follow those agency rules uh, just like they would have to follow the law and the board of course also has to follow its own rules that it puts out. And uh, as I just mentioned and as others have mentioned, uh, a lot of the work that's been going on is really geared towards uh, the rule writing process. I won't get into the nitty gritty of uh, everything that goes into the rule writing process and the various steps that we're gonna have to follow before these rules actually become official uh, and become enforceable. 
Uh, but if you are interested, you can go to that link. Uh, I'd say most importantly uh, is the notice and comment period, which is going to be coming up uh, in, in a few weeks here, depending on exactly when we get the rules filed. Notice and comment period has to last about 40 days. Uh, the rules will be publicly available. They'll be prominently displayed on our website, or I should say the proposed rules. And um, the notice and comment period will include public hearings. I know the board's planning on doing that. And the board, by law, has to consider all written and oral submissions uh, in, in terms of comments. So there is a lot more. You know, I think, as the chair pointed out, and as Bryn pointed out, this has already been a very robust uh, process in terms of public input. Uh, this board, of course, being a big part of that, but also the public comment periods during the subcommittee meetings and all the uh, public comment periods in addition to that and the board's interactions with people. But there's going to be still more uh, in the notice and comment period, and the board may make changes uh, to the proposed rules on the basis of those comments. So there is another opportunity for people to weigh in. This is what the board rules are likely to look like at a very high level view. Uh, there's going to be five rules, most likely. Uh, the board, of course, hasn't voted on this yet, so uh, these decisions are not final. But this is the likely outline of what things are going to look like. Rule one will be the licensing of cannabis establishments. <coughs> Rule two will be how those cannabis establishments are regulated. Rule three will have everything to do with medical cannabis and dispensaries and so forth. Um, rule four will be the compliance and enforcement piece of it. And rule five, which doesn't quite fit in anywhere else, is the board removal rule. And that's a <coughs> fact. Uh, that's because this board, unlike most boards, uh, the governor does not have the power to remove board members. That is only a power that's given to the other board members. So we have to write a special rule uh, to accommodate that. And this <coughs> is where we're going in the next uh, really, in the next few weeks, um, rules one and two will likely be pre-filed, which is just the term we use to describe the beginning of the process for becoming an official rule. Within about five or six business days, uh, keeping in mind, of course, that the state of Vermont uh, and state government, the Friday after Thanksgiving is not a business day. Uh, I will say we've been um, aiming and operating as though we will get rules one and two filed just before Thanksgiving, but it is certainly possible as we are trying to fit all the final pieces together that that gets pushed out to early uh, in the following week after Thanksgiving. But that is uh, our goal and what we, the way we've been working and operating is to get it filed really fairly soon. Um, and then as a result of that, the notice and comment period will take place from around late, mid to late December through late January. I think we're expecting to do the public hearings in January. And uh, of course, the board will consider and respond to comments and may make changes uh, accordingly. And then the final three rules will be likely be pre filed in early January. And of course, the uh, notice and comment period will follow that probably in the uh, approximately the month following that first notice and comment period. And the final piece uh, after that, once we're through notice and comment, once the board assimilates all the comments and puts them, responds to them, makes changes, or notifies, you know, has some discussion about what they want to do with them, uh, then the legislature gets a turn, and there's a legislative committee that will review the proposed rule and give input. And then once they're done, the rule will become final. And that legislative review process takes, it's hard to say exactly, uh, uh, because it's and it, to some degree, up to them as to what they, how they want to run their schedule. But uh, within a couple months, I would say, after the end of the notice and comment, <coughs> that final piece should be complete as well. And so that's a little overview, and I'll turn it back to Brian. Okay. So before I start um, giving an overview of the rules, are there any questions about the process? mentioned several times this is a draft um, very much a work in progress 
So this is rule one um, of the two rules that we're going to be talking about today. As David mentioned, um, we're going through the licensing of cannabis establishments rule and the regulation of cannabis establishments rule, that's rule two. And then the remaining rules are um, yet to come. So um, we start out in rule one with some general provisions, um, which includes the definition section, which I'm going to talk about briefly. Um, and then just some general provisions that apply throughout the rule. Section two is the license application format and the fees associated with license applications. Section three are the licensing tiers um, and the different license types that are tiered, which are the cultivation, the retail, and the manufacturing license types. Section four um, includes the license re uh, application requirements that apply to all of the licensing types. So these are just sort of general application requirements. Um, section five is the requirements that are, apply specifically to the different cultivation types. Section six, so the next three, four sections are the um, are those specific requirements for um, applications for the different license types. So manufacturers, retailers, testing labs, and integrated, different requirements um, for applications for them. <coughs> Section 10 is the application acceptance periods. Section 11 is the suitability determinations, and that includes the criminal record checks and what are presumptively <coughs> disqualifying criminal history records and then how to overcome those presumptive disqualifications. Section 12 is issuance of licenses. Section 13 applies specifically to those provisional licenses, which are the um, kind of preliminary license, licenses that an applicant can get before they've got all of their ducks in a row. Section 14 um, are considerations that the board is going to make for um, prioritizing application, license applications. And I'm just gonna note here that there is, um, the board has been discussing the priority of their consideration of applications. And um, they talked about that this morning in their board meeting, they have not voted on that. So um, the, what they discussed this morning in the board meeting does not appear here in the rule. Section 15, our license renewal procedures. Um, section, section 16 is the cannabis identification cards and the requirements for those cards. Um, section 17 is applicants on do, ongoing duty to disclose information to the board and then section 18 is confidentiality. So obviously I'm not going to go through the entire rule but I am going to um, direct your attention to a couple of different places and the first is um, the definition section. So um, it's important to note that all of those terms that are defined in, um, in Title VII, uh, Chapter 31, um, apply to the rules. So just as an example, um, some of what's covered there are um, the definitions of cannabis, definition of cannabis products, characterizing flavor, advertisement, child-resistant packaging, um, those are just examples of the terms that are defined in statute and they, are, they do not appear here in the definition section because they already apply in statute and they're kind of, in, they're incorporated by reference um, in this sort of opening sentence to the definition <coughs> section. And what, we, what, the, what we've done so far is to capitalize words that are defined in statute so it's clear that um, there is a definition associated with them. Although not not every defined <laughs> term is capitalized, but right. fre frequently used ones are capitalized. Right. Okay. Thanks for that. So the other um, thing that I'd like to note is that social equity applicant um, is defined here, um, and this is a definition that is based on the recommendation that came from the social equity subcommittee um, that the board approved. Um, the recommendation that the board approved. The board hasn't voted on this particular definition, I would just like to point out. Um, so the definition here is um, whether it is an applicant who's either socially disadvantaged 
or who has been arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis-related offense or who has a family member who has been. And then that socially disadvantaged is also a defined term, which you can see here in subsection F. And that, um, a socially disadvantaged is presumed to include black and Hispanic Americans and other individuals that the board determines um, are going to qualify in accordance with a portion of the Code of Federal Regulations. And it also includes um, individuals that the board determines have been disproportionately impacted. It, sorry, it includes people that can demonstrate that they have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. So those are the, that is um, the definition that I wanted to point out because it is new um, and the board will review it and vote on it when they meet next week. And the other... And I just point out, it is subject to change. The board hasn't been able to vote on it. And so just noting that, that is uh, uh, one of the pieces. Any of these pieces that you're looking at are subject to change because the board has not voted on the rules as a whole, but that one is one that they... Uh, that particular piece they haven't uh, voted on, so wanted to note that. Thank you. And the other piece that the board hasn't voted on is um, the lab standards piece that they did review it this morning, um, but have not voted on it. <coughs> so the second rule is um, the regulation of cannabis establishments. So again, I'm just gonna go through um, the index here to give you an overview of what's included. So again, we've got the general provisions, which includes a definition section. And again, we're incorporating those statutory definitions by reference. Um, also section uh, two is the regulations that are applicable to all cannabis establishments. And this is, um, so this is sort of a, a, a big portion that includes all of those records that are required, um, insurance requirements, background check requirements and um, obligations of continuing disclosure, health, safety, and sanitation requirements, employment and training, tracking of cannabis and cannabis products, transportation of cannabis and cannabis products, waste disposal, packaging, warning labels, advertising, composition presumptions for advertising, visitors to cannabis establishments, inspections, inversion and diversion from the legal market, um, how that is prohibited, compliance in other jurisdictions, reporting theft or loss, and co-location. <clears throat> and then um, 2.3 moves into regulations that are applicable specifically to cultivators, and that includes all of the pesticide requirements, um, visitors, testing, adulterated cannabis, packaging, inspection requirements, sanitation, cultivation and operations information that has to be on hand, and vendor and employee samples. And then we've got some specific um, regulations that are applicable to outdoor cultivators, and that includes outdoor security management, um, minimum security management practices, requirements for visibility from a public road, and then security for drying, curing, and storage, and allowance for winter indoor storage. 2.5 moves into regulations that are applicable to indoor cultivators, and then we've got, um, again, the security requirements, and then energy standards, and then reporting and reduction efforts um, that indoor cultivators are required to meet. And then regulations applicable to manufacturers, and that includes the safety requirements, security requirements, um, testing requirements, packaging, and then additives, records, and um, sampling for vendors and employees. 2.7 is regulations applicable to wholesalers, and that includes security requirements, processing and packaging. And then 2.8 is regulations applicable to retailers, and that um, includes language on buffer zones, um, retail security, age verification, packaging, standard operating procedures, samples, um, and the safety information flyer. 
2.9 is the regulations that apply to testing labs, cultivators, and, human, and manufacturers. So that includes like the testing requirements and po potency parameters, the moisture parameters, microbiological parameters, metal parameters, pesticides, residual solvents, and then um, language about new test records and other parameters and testing methods. And this is also language that the board um, has reviewed but has not yet voted on. Two point ten are the regulations that apply to the integrated licenses, um, and then two point eleven are the licensees' ongoing duty to disclose information to the board, which includes um, disclosure for changes in control, and then again two point twelve is the confidentiality requirements, and two point thirteen is the regulatory waiver. Was there anything I was going to? draw attention to it will too. Other than the lab, noting yeah. the lab hasn't been voted on, lab standards, I think that was it. Okay. So that is the high level overview of these regulations. Um, I am going to the, send out a PDF of these drafts um, to all of the advisory committee members for your review. Um, so that will give you time to review them and get back to the board before they meet on these uh, drafts next week. So I would be, we'd be happy to take questions or to hone in on any areas that are of particular interest to the advisory committee. Are we able <clears throat> to review, like, can we get hard copies of this? Yep. Or? Yep. Savon has his hand raised. Yes, Savon. Thanks, Brent. Uh, really, this is a question back to you, which is, um, are there any specific sections that you folks as the board and staff uh, particularly want us to delve into with more of a fine tooth comb? You know, I mean, obviously, we'll need some time to go through uh, the whole thing. But are there certain parts that you're uh, especially looking for feedback, or uh, do you feel that all of it is, is mostly good to go unless something jumps out to us? So I can start out by saying that the, obviously all of these, um, all of the language here is based on the recommendations that came from the various subcommittees. So um, each advisory committee member, like as a subcommittee member, is, is more than welcome to review the parts um, of the rules that apply to their various subcommittees. And um, we would very much appreciate your feedback on whether you think it appropriately um, captures what was recommended by the subcommittee. Um, but if, apart from that, I'm not sure that there are specific areas that the board is looking for feedback on, but I'll let them weigh in on that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would just take the advisory committee back to what we've determined as the legislative intent of the um, cannabis market here in Vermont, which is really to prioritize small-scale cultivation, environmental stewardship, um, social equity, um, embedding social equity, not just uh, by way of license holders, but throughout the industry. And so um, the rules uh, that apply to, to those areas and the accommodations that we can make to those uh, licensees, um, while still maintaining kind of our commitment to environmental sustainability, are areas where, you know, especially people that are in the industry that understand um, kind of, uh, the, the practices um, and the kind of how the market works, whether it's a corollary savant to alcohol or you know or not, like would be very helpful if you if you kind of put your eyes on it and say, hey, th this is not going to work, um, or this this has not worked in on the kind of liquor side of things. That that stuff is very helpful to us. Or this is unnecessary, or this is uh, overly uh, intrusive, or you know. We still have to deal with federal illegality of cannabis, but uh, so there's a lot in here that's probably overly intrusive. But um, you know, if you can kind of think about where um, where we can make an accommodation for small cultivators um, and the like, I think that that's particularly helpful for us. The only thing I'd add, real quick, and, and a lot very much along those lines, is obviously these rules cover a huge volume of subjects, and so feel free to 
assign yourselves to areas where you feel like you have expertise and um, dig in on those because it'll be really helpful to have tight focus on areas that you know well, and I think that'll benefit us uh, on the board, working for the board. Um, Savan, Chris, another one that we talked about today as a board is the idea of co-location, um, both kind of from a vertical integration standpoint of like kind of one license holder, but also um, as a kind of landlord licensee and kind of tenant licensees um, co-locating in a single physical address. Um, you know, that's an area where certain states allow it, other states don't allow it. Um, and we walked through what I kind of thought were the pros and cons of co-location today. Um, but it's an area where, uh, you know, we, we, it's new to us. And if you have thoughts on that as well, I, I would point you there to that section. That's a well-worn subject in alcohol, so I'll definitely take a look. Great. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions from a process standpoint? Um, you know, we laid out a very high-level overview of what our next steps are uh, from a rulemaking perspective. Um, of course, we still need um, a fee bill, so we still have we still have a few um, aspects that we're going to have to rely on the legislature for, um, and uh, we need kind of a compliance enforcement um, team. We need a licensing portal, uh, which is a tech project. Um, so our agency of digital services is in the process of kind of laying out a schedule for us on the kind of go live date for our licensing portal. Um, and uh, we need licensing review staff resources as well. Um, so um, there, there are certain, while we may have our rules in time for uh, kind of the, the timelines that are laid out in our legislation, a lot needs to fall into place for us to actually be able to go live on May 1st as the um, legislation directs us to. And then of course there's the medical program. Um, we um, have kind of a plan in place to assume the medical program on January 1st, 2022. Um, we have, um, as part of kind of our condition of licensure, we have um, a plan in place to maintain the continuity of services and products for that program during this transition and beyond. Um, but uh, those rules are set to expire in statutes next year, so that we're gonna be working on um, kind of replacement rules and statutes for that. That'll require legislative action as well. So um, there's a lot of moving pieces, and the rules are one part of it. Um, you know, we don't wanna overly burden this advisory committee more than we already have, um, but we do kind of want to continue the relationship with you all um, as we move forward through these major kind of milestones. And that's why we called you here together today is, you know, we put our kind of we're putting our final touches on this and we'd really appreciate any feedback you can that you have, you know, think about your area of expertise, why you were selected to, to be a part of the advisory committee. And really, if you can, I know it's asking a lot, but to drill down on the areas that you see here where you feel most capable of kind of giving us advice, giving us recommendations, uh, you know, pointing out unintended consequences and red flags. Meg has her hand raised. Meg. Hi, I'm sorry, Bryn, I know you said this, but uh, you'll be sending out this draft to all of us. When did you need our feedback by? So the board, the goal right now is for the board to meet on Tuesday um, to review the rules and vote on them. That is the plan right now. So if possible, before the board meeting on Tuesday, which right now is scheduled for 10 o'clock. Okay, great, thank you. There are ways for us to modify later than Tuesday, of course. So please, yeah. I mean, that is the, 
the cleanest way is for us to get recommendations and make changes on Tuesday, but, uh, but that's not the kind of drop dead date for changes to these rules. No, by all means, and this is, you know, I think David went over this in the process. The rulemaking process is a public process, so there will be multiple opportunities for feedback um, as we move through that process. So even after we pre-file the rules, um, there will be, they will, they will change. We will be responsive to all of the feedback that we get during that time as well. So does anyone just have any last kind of thoughts right now? I know we kind of dropped a lot of information on you and we didn't go you know, line by line through this. Um, going line by line would take a number of hours, uh, but um, you know, if there, if there are any kind of last concluding thoughts um, before we ask, send you on your way, um, please um, feel free to raise them now. Um, Otherwise, we'll turn to public comment. Okay, um, well, th thank you all again. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with all of you. Um, I know no one really asked this. You got assigned this role, or many of you did. Um, but it's it's been, I think, you know, we really do have we're charting a new way forward in Vermont, and it's different than any other state has done it. And um, it's it's kind of it has a Vermont ethos built into it. So it's it's kind of a, an exciting document, exciting group of rules, and um, it's really again a reflection of the input and the work that you all did. So thank you. Um, and I would just, if anyone uh, from the public would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hands and. Um, We'll start with uh, Dave Silverman. Uh, thank you, James. Um, I, I don't want you to receive this question as coming under 1 VSA 317. Um, mm -hmm. Is the draft that you are sending available to the public at this time? And if not, when can the public or me uh, see a draft of these regulations. So it is not available to the public yet, um, but it will be available and posted on our website at our next board meeting, which right now is going to be Tuesday at 10 o'clock. So, so just, just to be clear, and I'm sorry for following up, um, before the Tuesday 10 a.m. meeting adjourns, the public will have access to these rules draft in, in some sort of downloadable format? Yes. Thank you very much. We have Jen next. Hi, uh, this is Jen Daniels, Maristone Farms. Um, I have, a, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, um, I have a, three comments that I'll also submit in writing um, and I will just read them. Um, they're crafted. One's on the co-ops, which we mentioned before. One's on outdoor cultivation, and one's on access by out-of-state brands. Um, is it okay to read them? There are about a couple of points to each one. Sure. Okay, great. Um, so we just wanted to emphasize um, that co-ops should be included in the licensing structure um, for the following reasons. Uh, to strengthen competitiveness for small businesses which we are one, um, provide an additional pathway for social equity benefits, support uh, market price stability, protect growers from unfavorable distribution terms, and then finally elevate Vermont's craft brand. Um, limiting wholesale licenses to co-ops would also be wise given the dispersed nature of the adult use retail market, the increased costs of which will exert downward pressure on prices paid to growers. Um, on outdoor cultivation, um, we feel that it should be increased well beyond the current 20% share of supply recommended in the 1015 report. Um, the 20% recommendation appears to result from erroneous assumptions. The report assumes that harvest will hit the market during a period of low demand when, in fact, as we're experiencing right now, uh, October crop harvests are typically ready for retail just in time for the holidays. Um, the report 
overlooks the fact that flour is shelf stable for at least six to 12 months if it's stored properly. Uh, and then finally, the report uh, does not sufficiently account for the importance of terroir for Vermont's brand, given Vermont's excellent climate. Um, yes, there are definitely issues with mold and depending on where you are, but that's pretty much writ large when you're farming. Um, and elevating the Emerald Triangle of the East, as folks like to say, um, indoor flower is certainly fine, and it is both an art and a science, but it shouldn't discount um, the, the unique flavors of outdoor grow, especially when we're looking across the entire country. And then finally, um, about access by out-of-state brands to the Vermont market. Um, should be restricted um, or eliminated in order to support the Vermont brand and the diversified small business oriented character of Vermont's adult use program. Um, we have three points on that. Um, briefly, major national brands exert undue influence over producers throughout all kinds of agricultural value chains, even when they have no ownership stake. The advantages obtained by producers licensing national brands, not only in market access, but also access to investor capital in favorable terms for ancillary materials, will enable them to dominate the retail market in Vermont, squeezing out many, if not most, local brands. And then um, finally, the dominance of national brands on Vermont shelves will undermine uh, Vermont's craft. Thank you for that lengthy comment um, and all the work you're doing. Thank you, Jen. Any other uh, public comments? Uh, ben Fisher. Hello. Uh, thanks so much for everything you guys are doing. Um, I've written a number of comments to the, you know, uh, written comment section, and I was just uh, hoping for a chance to advocate for uh, for the ability of cultivators uh, to do some small-scale manufacturing of product development. Um, I'm a long-time hemp grower, but I've been growing hemp uh, since 2016. And we're, you know, currently allowed to uh, also obtain manufacturer's permits. And I just think that at least the lower tier and some uh, product development should be allowed to cultivators, otherwise, you know, uh, really all the products that are going to be hitting the market. It, uh, I'm just not sure I see good reasoning as to why uh, the growers themselves, if you have a cultivator permit, wouldn't be allowed to develop their own products. Uh, that's my comment. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hey, Savon, do you mind if I wait till after the public comment period? Great. Uh, next, we have uh, Jeffrey Pizzatillo. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I'm just looking at the uh, October 15th report, market structure, um, license and fees and whatnot, and I'm seeing that the uh, outdoor cultivation canopy size is the same as mixed light and indoor. Um, I'm assuming that's an oversight. Um, as we all know, growing 1,000 feet outside is not the same as growing 1,000 feet inside. Um, in fact, a standard has evolved in legal states over the years that adopts a cultivation ratio. Uh, we propose for every 4,000 square feet outside, there's 2,000 square feet mixed light and 1,000 square feet indoor. What's gonna happen is if we roll forward with what we're proposing, uh, we will have the inequitable uh, production from the full sun and mixed light categories. Um, so please keep this in mind. I hope this was an oversight. Uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation in the coming days to, to clarify and make that uh, correction in the canopy size. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, anyone else who's joined via the link would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hands. Um, I see one person by phone um, if you join by phone and would like to make a comment, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. All right, well then we'll close the public comment period. Um, Savan, any other members of the advisory committee would like to make, can I respond to any of those points or would like to have any last discussion before we adjourn, Savan? 
Yeah, this is such a general question. Um, and perhaps this was covered in one of the subcommittees that wasn't the subcommittees I was on, or perhaps maybe we'll see some of this in the, in the rulemaking. But is there anything that uh, you folks can share with us uh, at this point about any developments um, regarding financing, uh, specifically banks or credit unions? I, I know that federal, uh, federally chartered institutions aren't going to be able to work with any of our licensees. Um, but is there any uh, progress with any uh, Vermont chartered um, financial institutions that have expressed willingness to, to bank our licensees? So um, I have not heard, we've been having kind of financial roundtables and we incorporated a lot of the recommendations and the, the asks that those financial institutions in Vermont wanted um, into our recommendations, um, into our rules. Uh, around ownership and criminal history records and the kind of things that might kind of trigger a suspicious activity report, for instance. Um, so I think that the, the financial institutions will feel comfortable with what is in our application process um, and maybe that will entice them in. Uh, it's my understanding that VSECU um, will be uh, engaged in a small scale in banking, certainly the um, the um, licenses, licensees that they have current relationships with and, and a little bit beyond that is my understanding. Um, but, um, you know, we haven't heard any kind of large scale kind of people jumping in, but we do, you know, anecdotally and from what I hear from other states, um, there are banks uh, that are willing to come to, state charter banks that are willing to come into Vermont and do some banking with us. Um, so, um, you know, I think we're still kind of waiting, wait, waiting, waiting and seeing what that looks like. Um, we did require, as part of our licensure, um, a depository account or an attempt to make one, you know, demonstrate hardship. So we are going to encourage people to um, have a relationship with a financial institution. Um, so uh, we'll see how it goes, honestly. It's an it's a experiment that we're running right now. Thank you. Anything else from the uh, advisory committee? Yeah. Well, I guess, um, you know, just thank you once again. Um, I don't want to be overly effusive, but I really, you know, when we started this process with the advisory committee in September, I really did think that we had lost a whole year. Um, and it seems like we're because of the incredible work and the pace that you've all been working at, it seems like we're have a path forward to be back on track, which is an incredible feat. Um, so thank you all, and um, I will adjourn this meeting.